Hello everyone. My name is Thư Dương, PhD in Cell and Molecular Biology at Paramount School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, one of the eight Ivy League institutions of the United States of America. I come from Hung Yen Province in Vietnam. That's my father's hometown. At Penn, I can count on two hands the number of Vietnamese people, not like other Vietnamese graduate students who normally have international undergraduate education before coming to Penn. I went straight from Vietnam to America, which is rare, and that is why I was chosen as an example for the International Student Spotlight to promote diversity of my PhD incoming class in the fall 2011. It was an awesome feeling, just like I won top five in a beauty pageant and my national flag was shown on the newsletter of the program. In the picture, I wore my uh, national dress outside. As I described in the article, having the admission to uh, Penn for my PhD was like a dream came true. That dream would not come true if I did not have the courage to ask for an opportunity to be interviewed online. In 2010, I received a prestigious fellowship from the Vietnam Education Foundation. Out of 1,000 applicants, only 45 people were selected. I was one of them. But there was a catch. I can only use the fellowship if I could find a host university to accept me as a PhD student. Penn was my dream school. After applying to Penn, I waited until February when normally three rounds of interview were conducted. But I did not receive any invitation. So I contacted the department chair and learned that the chair hesitated to interview me because my GRE was low. GRE stands for Graduate Record Examination. It is a standardized test that students need to take to prove their verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking and analytical writing skill. In, I was th sitting in the common room of the stem cell lab where I work as a research assistant. I was reading some paper when the email, the rejection email from the department chair arrived. Her email sent directly to one of the professors whom I contact to show my research interest. I was copying that email. Her email was just one sentence. Dear Peter, despite the fellowship, I'm afraid her GAE score is not good enough. Dot, dot, dot. My stomach dropped. I knew I had no chance. Within the 10 seconds, as I wondered why she only focused on my low GAE score and ignored all the other parts of my application, I felt shameful. My face turned hot and red. My heart beat fast. I think it's good busy in pumping the blood to my face. To seek out the last ray of hope, I quickly composed an email within a couple of minutes. This is the email. I still save it as, an, as evidence to inspire younger Vietnamese people to speak up for themselves. In the email, I highlighted my research experience in the lab, academic standing, strong work ethic, and motivation. A week later, I received the email to schedule my interview appointment. I, to prepare for the interview, I Google all common interview questions. Ask my friend who was a PhD student at UMass Medical School to review all the answers. Print them out and paste them on the wall near my study corner and rehearse so many times before the official interview. That interview turned into an admission, which began my wonderful journey in the U.S. 
Recently, Penn and many other U.S. universities have removed GRE as a requirement for graduate school application. Yet, in 2011, if I did not ask and advocate for myself, I would not turn my studying abroad dream into a reality. The right ask at the right time, along with serious effort in preparation, can turn into a life-changing opportunity. Can you imagine yourself in a situation when you thought you reached your dream, like you got a high-paid wonderful job, or you got accepted to a prestigious university? Everyone congratulates you for your achievement. Family holds party to wish you well, then your dream turns into a nightmare. That's what my situation in the fall semester of my first year as a PhD student. I was sitting in the corner of the cell 600 class when the TA returned the exam for the, the result for the first exam. It was big class because there was more than a hundred students registered for the course. I chose to sit in the corner because, you know, I feel invisibly safe in there. I got 54 out of 100. I thought to myself, Thu, you didn't even understand some question, exam question. So 54 out of 100, not too bad, but you need to do it better next time. It took an hour for the TA to go over all the answer of the question of the exam. At the end of the class, the grade distribution was shown on the screen. And the TA announced that this course will be, would be evaluated by the principal under the curve grading. I was shocked to see that I am in the far, I was in the far left of the curve, meaning that my grade was much below the average. With this position, I would fail the course. At that moment, I knew I was in big trouble. At the end of the day, I knew I was in serious trouble when the department chair emailed me and asked to meet me the next day in her office to discuss the exam situation. I walked home through Biopond, a beautiful scenic place on UPenn campus. The other day, it looked, the scene looked, looked so beautiful. On that day, everything looked so gloomy. My feet felt so heavy. As I dragged myself home, all the negative thoughts came into play. What if I failed the course? and couldn't get the B average at the end of the semester to maintain the fellowship, I would become a huge failure and a shame to my family in Vietnam. If I gave up, all these thoughts would become a reality, or I could choose to fight to get better. The meeting with the department chair the next day was a huge relief. I learned that if I did not understand the exam question due to the language barrier, I could ask the TA to explain the question to me. They couldn't tell me the answer, but they could help me with the English vocabulary. In addition, the department chair was so nice to offer to hire a personal tutor to help me study the cell 600. From that point to the end of the semester, I only sleep four to five hours a day, stay up late to listen to recorded lecture, borrow notes from my friend, join a small study group, and took, un took advantage of own TA office hour. At the end of the third semester, I got B- minus for self second red. Two other course, I got A-. minus. So, woohoo! I survived! I overcame the first hardest semester of my PhD training thanks to the courage to accept failure and the courage to believe that I can improve myself quickly. Some people think that think of courage as if it is an innate characteristic. It is there when you need it. I can tell you that it is not. Courage is a skill and it can be improved. Here are three steps I did to 
to fight and strengthen my courage? Step 1. Identify your fears. This step includes finding out what are your fears, why do you have those fears, and how do you embrace your fears to overcome the negative impact on your life. My strongest fear is that I am not good enough. That I was born as a girl couldn't do what a boy can do. I am one of six children. My parents have five daughters and one son. Here are my parents, my sister, and my youngest brother. My youngest brother is 17 years younger than me. The reason why my parents have so many children is because my father is the first son of my grandparents. So my parents try so many times to have a son to continue the family last name into the next generation, a long-lasting Vietnamese tradition. I remember when I was still a little girl, my uncle invited me and my, older and two, my two older sisters to his house for a meal. Before eating, he asked my sister to draw three circles on the wall, asked each of us to lie up closely to that circle and read a poem out loud. Chúng con là lũ vịt rời, bé thì ăn hại, lớn thì bay đi. In English, it means we are little duckling. When we were young, we did nothing. When we grow up, we fly away. That poem was very popular in Vietnamese culture to show a tradition that believes one man is more valuable than many women. That tradition hurt me. All of my childhood, I wish I were a boy. All of my childhood, I studied very hard to reach the outstanding academic performance. So my father can submit the certificate of excellence to his company and get a reward of $10 for a certificate. $10 was a significant amount of money because you know at that time it only cost 10 to 20 cents for a meal. My, my father's company policy gave more money if there was a continuation of excellent academic performance. I was so proud to write on top of the certificate, Daughter of Mr. Zhuang, to confirm my identity. My dad has five outstanding daughters, so you can imagine how thick that stack of certificate got each year. None of my dad, colleague, and neighbors had that kind of great achievement from their children. That, re that kind of reward became my badge of honor and my source of motivation to prove to the world that I, as a girl, can achieve anything in life. To, em to embrace the fear of not being as good as a boy, I focus on transforming it into my strong, strong, of, my strong source of energy. To fuel me to go through difficulties and challenges to reach my next goal in life. Second step, find your sense of purpose. If I ever go through any obstacle in the past, I try to find a solution for it and for the people may have the same issue. For example, when I was younger, I didn't have many good textbooks. Therefore, in 2012, I joined the Vietnam Book Drive project to bring thousands of English textbooks from the U.S. to 10 universities in Vietnam. In 2014, I initiated the Vietnam Book Drive for Kids project to improve English learning and cultivate early reading habit for kids in Vietnam. When I saw a gap in public knowledge about stem cell research and application that caused some tragedy when someone injects stem cells into the face of the clients to make them look younger. I knew I need to, to do something. In 2018, I collaborated with my friend to translate a book called 
stem cell and insiders into Vietnamese. 6,000 copies were sold. As I encounter a new challenge, I embrace new opportunity to practice courage in doing new things for a meaningful purpose. These activities not only help me to build my skill outside of academia, but also become a source of inspiration for me to live a meaningful life. If you look around, you can find plenty of purposes to make a positive impact on society. So do not hesitate to take action and start building your current muscle. Step 3. By stepping out of your comfort zone and immersing yourself in a new environment. I have a routine of accepting new challenges first and then dealing with them later. Just like this TEDx Youth Talk, I agree to deliver a talk within three seconds of receiving the invitation from the organ organizer of the TEDx Youth at Lonoi Lake in Hung Yen. Then I spend days of reflection, hours of composing the script, hours of modifying the message based on friends' uh, feedback. I learn through practice. And it is always the fastest road for me to improve myself. If you want to uh, improve your public speaking, try to deliver a talk. You can try to deliver your talk to a small group of friends that can offer a safe environment. Then move up to deliver your talk to a bigger group. As soon as you accept a new challenge, you step out of your comfort zone and you give yourself an opportunity to practice courage. Courage can be strengthened and nurtured by practicing the courage of asking, dealing with fear and failure, to finding a, a strong sense of purpose by looking deeply into your personal experience. I firmly believe that any one of us can make a greater impact to society by sharing, learning, and practicing courage. Do not hesitate to share your own story and your journey to become courageous. Thank you.